All right, so who remembers what we're doing? Fixed point theorems. In particular, who's Lemma? Sperner. Excellent. Wow. Great participation so far today. All right, so we're trying to do Sperner's lemma. And that says that if we are given a triangle and we have to color the bottom zeros to ones, this one's ones to twos, this one's zeros to ones, that as we subdivide it, there's always going to be one triangle that has all three uh, numbers. This is, of course, just one specific case. In general, we would not have a triangle. We would have a thing, thing yes. Another name for thing. Morphous blob. OK, so one direction of going it is because there's two different ways of interpreting thing. One direction was we could have a circle. We could have a square. We could have some other two-dimensional region that's topologically equivalent to the triangle. And knowing what goes on here would give us a result over there. The other thing we could do is we could increase the dimension. We could go from triangle to tetrahedron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm only going to prove Sperner's lemma in the cases of dimension 1 and dimension 2. The reason is this is enough to get a great sense of what the proof is. And if we can understand the proof in this case, we can then do the proof in general. So I think step one is let's finally prove Sperner's lemma. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about an application of Sperner's lemma to the you know, fair rental problem, uh, cake cutting, stuff like that. And then we'll go back and talk about how this actually gives us a fixed point. So uh, we haven't said yet why Sperner's lemma gives us a fixed point. Somehow it seems reasonable if we've got all these different numbers. If we have one thing that's arbitrarily small that has all three numbers, maybe that means that somehow that's a fixed point. These numbers are maybe telling us how the function's moving. And if it's got to move in all three ways, the only way that can happen is if it doesn't move at all. But we have to formally show that Sperner's lemma does imply a fixed point exists. Fixed point theorems come in two flavors. What are the two flavors of fixed point theorems? Constructive and non-constructive. If you had to choose, which would you choose? Constructive, right? Constructives are typically better. They tell you how to find something. Uh, before the exam, the solution key to the, uh, one of the problems was actually written on a mural at the clock. There was a little wall where you were allowed to doodle. And so Kayla and I went there, and we actually wrote down the solution. So this is. It was constructive, but it wasn't very useful to know that there was a solution somewhere on campus. If you didn't know where on campus that solution was, it's not that helpful. Okay? We want constructive things if possible. Sperner's lemma initially is going to be non-constructive. And if you think about it, this is very disappointing. Right? You don't want to know if you're trying to define, um, we're going to be living in Boston and New York, a bunch of us next year. We want to split the rooms in this apartment. We want to figure out how much to assign each person in rent. Oh, good. There's a way to do it, and everybody will be happy. If that was the end of the story, <laughs> this would not lead to roommate bliss. Right? There would still be arguments among the different roommates as to how much you want to pay. In order for this to be useful, you have to find, well, how do we allocate the rooms and the rent so that everybody's happy? We want to have a constructive version of these fixed point theorems. It turns out in some special cases, Sperner's lemma can be made constructive. So here's the claim. In any legal labeling, there exists a triangle with all three labels. And again, This is, this is probably poorly drawn, but oh well, probably drawn. All right, so we, we have some labeling. And over here, we're only allowed to use zeros and ones. Here, we can only use ones and twos. Here, we can only use zeros and twos. And somehow, when we then choose how to label in the interior, no matter how we choose to do it, there has to be at least one. And the key idea is we're going to count and get an odd number have all three labels. Therefore, one exists. 
It's not going to tell us where it is. It's not going to tell us how many. It's going to just tell us that there has to be at least one. All right, so the proof in general is by induction. So we're going to start off and do the one simplex. So we have 0 here, we have 1 here. <coughs> something like this. We have some kind of labeling. And what we want to do is we want to prove that there's at least one subinterval that has a 0 and a 1. Now if you think about it, if you just start at the right and move down, as soon as I hit a 0, I win. That's not going to be an argument that's going to generalize as well. And so what we want to do is we want to prove more than just that we win. We want to prove something about how we win. We're going to win with an odd number. So they're going to overload notation. Let f of 0, 1 equal the number of <coughs> subintervals with both a 0 and a 1. So the interval 1, 0 counts, the interval 0, 1 counts. Okay? So order doesn't matter. What else could I look at? So this is the number of subintervals that have a 0 and a 1. What else could I look at? Good. So let's let f0, 0, 0 be the number of subintervals with two zeros. OK? Let's count how many zeros there are on the interval. Count, count the number of zeros. How many of the endpoints are going to be 0? One endpoint is 0. What about the internal zeros? Well, if I have an internal 0, it's either got to be from a 0, 0 or a 0, 1. So every internal 0 is from one of these two intervals. How many times do you count an internal 0? Exactly twice. Because if you have a 0 here, you count it in the interval 1, 0, and then you count it on the next side. So every internal 0 is counted twice. All internal zeros are double counted. What about the zeros on the edge, the two vertices? How many times are those counted? <coughs> Once. So zeros at edges, with the vertex, only once. So the total number of zeros, if I look at how many zero ones I have, and I look at how many zero zeros I have, this is going to double count the number of zeros. Why double count minus one? Right, but we've got to be we've got to be very very careful for this. So, how many zeros does f zero zero give you? In general, how many? zeros are in the subinterval 0, 0. So this is giving me two zeros. So the number of subintervals here is f0, 0. How many zeros does it contribute? So 
So maybe it would be easy if we, you know, let's take a specific example and let's write everything down. <coughs> so let's use a camera. Okay. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. All right? Let's count how many 0, 0 intervals do we have. Oh, here. This way. We have 1, 2, 3, 3, 0, 0 intervals. How many 0, 1 intervals? Remember, I don't care if it's 0, 1, or 1, 0. So this is my first one, my second one, my third one, my fourth one, my fifth one. Right? And then I have one zero at the edge. How many zeros does each interval zero zero give us? Each one gives two. Each gives two zeros. So this is going to give us three times two. What about the zero ones? How many zeros does each give? Each gives how many zeros? One. Okay, now we have one zero at the edge. All right, that's not so bad. One zero at the edge is just one. So if we count all of this up, six, five, and one adds up to One, two, three, four, five, six. So we've double counted every the total number of zeros. So let's do it a little bit more slowly. If we look in the interior, we have one, two, three, four, five. Each zero there should be counted twice. And so if I look at the zero over here, I counted it once with this interval, and I counted it once with that interval. This zero was counted twice. This zero was counted once here, once here. It was counted twice. So all of these zeros, every interior zero is counted twice. What about this zero over here? How many times was this one counted? Twice. twice. Why was that counted twice? Because I threw in the extra zero at the edge at the end, right? That's why it's matching up at the very, very end. I threw in the fact that every, other, every interior zero is counted twice, but the one at the edge is not counted twice. Well, I'm one away from counting everything by twice. Let's just add one. And now everything is counted twice. So if I look at F00 plus F01, I multiply this by 2 because this contributes two zeros. I multiply this by 1 because that contributes one zero. And I add 1. What kind of number do I get? I get 2 times the number of zeros. So again, I'm a huge fan of cumbersome notation. And when I teach Calc 3, if I have a double integral to do, I'll write my integrals. Integral x goes from 0 to 1, integral y goes from 0 to 3, just so it's clear what's going on. Do I need to write 1 times f of 0, 1? No. no. It helps, though. It's telling me I have to weight this by a factor of 2. I have to weight this by a factor of 1. And so I really do like putting in these 2s and the 1s over here. And so now if I count, Every time I get the interval 0, 0, I get two zeros. Every time I have the interval 0, 1, or 1, 0, I get one zero. And I've almost double counted everything. I forgot I've only counted that final zero once. Let me put in an extra one. And now I've double counted everything. We actually know that this is a positive number because we know there's at least one zero. It doesn't matter. What kind of number is this? Even. What kind of number is this? Even. 
Well, the only way I can have this be even is if this middle piece also has to be even. Because 1 is odd, exercise, f of 0, 1 is odd. There's no other way for this equation to be satisfied. Therefore, f of 0, 1 is not empty. So the question is, did, I, did we just prove Sperner's lemma in one dimension, or did I only prove it for this special choice? I proved it just for the special choice, but the proof in general is essentially what we've just done. Yeah, this equation in the end is true. We actually did the special case to try to make it a little bit clearer as to what was going on and why we want to count in the way we're doing. But really, we have proven Sperner's lemma in one dimension. There are not that many ideas in mathematics. This is an idea. Okay? I don't know if you've ever seen this idea before, but if you have an odd number of elements, it's not empty. Okay? This is an extremely powerful proof. It's very sad if you prove something has an even number of elements, it could be empty. But in this case, we know there has to be at least one 0, 1 interval, subinterval. And there's Sperner's lemma in one dimension. Now that we have Sperner in one dimension, what should we do? Sperner in two, right? The proof is going to be very similar. Will it still be odd? It will still be odd. And so Spooner's lemma is not just that there exists a 0, 1, 2, you know, triangle, or in general a 0, 1, 2, 3, K hypertriangle, but that the number of such is odd. Okay? For most applications, uh, since we're only guaranteed that there is one, we typically don't use the fact that it's an odd number. We just use the fact that it's at least one. But we actually do get a little bit more information. What this would mean is that if you can find two such triangles, what do you know? I'm sorry? There has to be another one. Okay. I don't know of any situation where... Um, no, I take that back. In, so, in some things in analytic number theory, I actually do know of situations where we know something has an odd number of zeros, and we show it vanishes to order two. And as soon as you know it vanishes to order two and it's odd, you now know that there has to be another zero. And in fact, that was one of the key steps in uh, some major proofs. So I will you know, try to put some notes about that you know, for people who want some advanced theory. This is related to elliptic curves. And in terms of, you know, if, you've, if anybody here has taken like algebraic number theory, it's related to class numbers and trying to count them very well. This idea of oddness you know, implying non-empty is extremely powerful. All right, so now we want to do the two-dimensional case. We want a 0, 1, 2 sub-triangle. And the idea of the proof, well, not surprising since I've said it's induction, is to somehow reduce back to the one-dimensional case. Now, the, the book somewhat overloads notation. They're using the letter F to count how many we have of a given configuration. And the book will talk about how many zeros we have, how many zero ones we have, how many zero one twos we have, all in the same problem. So you have your function F is on some kind of tuple, but the tuple length doesn't have to be constant. It's not horrible notation. Uh, you should have seen vectors in linear algebra or calc 3. How do you denote the length of a vector? Okay, so you went like this, not like the spark like this. So you're denoting it with lines like that for length. Lines. Or double lines. So when I teach the freshmen, I try to use the double lines. Why? Because the freshmen, oh, I know this is being recorded, hi. Uh, the freshmen often forget and confuse the vectors with the scalars. You know, of course, I know none of you do that anymore, but you know, when you're starting off, it's sometimes difficult to remember which quantity is a vector, which quantity is a number. Given that, why do you think I like the double lines? Distinguish it from absolute value. Distinguish it from absolute value. Hey, you know, really draw attention to the fact there's a vector inside. 
what this is doing is saying, come on, we're talking about length, the length of a vector, the length of a number. This is really a notion that can be defined both for numbers and for vectors. And let's use and let's extend the notion of the absolute value so it's no longer just talking about the absolute value of a number, but also the absolute value of a vector. And so how many of you have used this notation for the length of a vector? All right, so if you're upset with the book's notation, you've been doing this yourself. Okay? The difficulty with this is it gets harder to just quickly glance down and see what's going on. And so when you use something like this, you lose the ability of quickly looking down and seeing what is being applied. Well, I can look and see how many things I have on the inside so it's not so confusing. All right, so we want to proceed now by induction. So we have zero here, we have one here, we have two here. And let's study zero, one segments. How many different segments could I have chosen to study? Yes? Why three different ones? Why three could I have studied? You could have studied zero, two segments. Okay, so I could have studied zero. Uh, what could I have done? Zero. Zero, one. What else could I have studied? Could have studied 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. I, there were six possible things to study. Why are we choosing 0, 1? We already did them in the one-dimensional case. The idea is if we can somehow use the one-dimensional case, the one-dimensional case was proving the existence of a zero one. We agree that these ones over here, they're all equivalent. They're two distinct labels. And the idea is to somehow use the fact that Spurner is true in one dimension to reduce something down here. How many zero ones are we going to find along this line segment over here? None. How many will we find along here? Zero. How many will we find along here? At least one. You can do better than at least one. An odd number. Because two is unfortunately at least one. So here, by induction, have an odd number of zero, one here. And over here we have no zero ones. And over here we have no zero ones. So now we're going to play the game exactly as before. So we chose this one to use induction. And so we're not going to consider these other ones. Let's count how many zero ones we could have. Well, if I'm going to have a 0, 1, it's got to be in a triangle that has a 0, 1 in it. I don't care about orientation. So what's my other possible labels? 0. What else? 1. And in a surprise, 2. How many 0, 1s do I have in this triangle? OK. And at most, how many? How many 0, 1's intervals are there in this triangle? There's two. This is a 0, 1. This is a 0, 1. This triangle has two of them. What about this triangle? How many does this have? This one also has two. What about this triangle? One. So now we're going to count how many zero one edges do we have. Okay, this is going to be very similar to what we did before. I'm going to try to do it without you know drawing the specific example. So 
let's count 0, 1 edges. Now, if you're an interior edge, how many times do you count it? So how many times are we counting the interior edges? Still twice. I'm sorry? Still twice. still twice. So those are still going to be counted twice. All right, so let me see if I want to count the interior edges or if I want to just count the number of zeros. Um, all right, let's see. So 0, 1 um, inter subintervals. If interior. Right, count twice. And so if it's an interior edge, there's got to be another triangle on the other side, and I'm going to count it from both triangles. If on the boundary, how many times? <coughs> how many times do we count it? We count, we count it once, which is an odd number. <laughs> And in fact, any odd number would have been fine. If we just said it was an odd number and we wrote it as you know, 2L plus 1, the rest of the proof would follow identically and we'd be absolutely fine. So let's count how many 0, 1s we have. So we have the triangle 0, 0, 1. And how many times does that give us a 0, 1? Twice. Then we have the triangle F011. How many times does that give us? Twice again. Then we have the triangle F of 012. How many times does that give us? Once. So I'm going to put in a 1. Now, the problem is, does that count everything twice? No, which ones are not counted twice? I'm sorry? I'm saying uh, in the, the interval 0, 1, maybe, maybe we'll draw. So if I have something like this, you know, 0, 1, 2, 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 2, 1. So if, if one of the sub-triangles is, uh, is on a boundary, then it's like F of 0, 1. Right, so if it's, if it's over here, yeah. I haven't counted that 0, 1 twice. I've only counted it once. So I have to add all the 0, 1s on the boundary plus all 0, 1 on the boundary. And when I do that, what do I get? I now get what? Two times the number of 0, 1s. So the problem is, this almost double counted every subinterval 0, 1. If it was an interior 0, 1, so you know, if I put in a bunch of zeros inside here, I put a 0 here, 2 there, um, this 0, 1 is shared by these two triangles. That counts twice. This 0, 1 is only counted once. So anything along this boundary, unfortunately, we are only counting once. If, it, if there were no 0, 1s on the boundary, then that's great. Then we would have double counted every 0, 1. But because there could be boundary 0, 1s, in fact, there have to be, we just showed that by induction, we are not double counting everything. But we are so close to double counting, right? The only thing that's preventing us from double counting is that anything that was on the boundary, on that 0, 1 big edge, was counted only once. Well, let's count it again. So let's just add it in. And so now when you look at this expression, what kind of number is this? Even. So this is even. 
the next one, even. If you've taken abstract algebra, just look at everything mod 2. This one over here, even. What do we know about all the zero ones on the boundary? It's odd. By induction, it's odd. Therefore, what must we conclude? Therefore, F012 is odd. That's amazing. OK? There is no point in doing the general case on the board. Right? If it's not clear at this point, it's not going to be clear when I put in you know, general indices. Right? When a proof like this, you want to get a flavor, what a feel of what's going on in your small dimensions. It also starts to get harder to visualize what's going on. I can still draw things over now. If I had to divide tetrahedron to tetrahedron, it's not going to be pretty. You know, we can see if Professor Devados is free to come down and you know, take over the class for a couple of minutes. You know, he can draw far better than I can. You need to find a way to look at these things abstractly. And the idea is we're now going on and we now know the existence of a 0, 1, 2 subtriangle from the existence of a 0, 1 subinterval. If we went to the next level, if we tried to do 0, 1, 2, 3, we have a lot of possibilities to look at. What do you think would be the one we would look at? 0, 1, 2. Because we know by induction we can flow down to one of the faces of the region and there has to be an odd number there. So the idea would be we probably try to count how many 0, 1, 2's there are in this higher dimensional thing and get that when we add what's going on on the boundary, it's an even number. Aha, we know by induction there's an odd number on the boundary, therefore again we have the existence now of a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So if you want a good exercise, try to prove this in general. Okay, any questions about Sperner? Okay. So what we want to do now is we want to prove why Sperner implies the fixed point theorem and then going from that to applications. So Sperner implies Brouwer fixed point theorem. Okay. So again, if you've taken real analysis right now, this is a great way to review. If you haven't taken real analysis, this is a great way to decide whether or not you want to continue and take that class. We have our function f from our simplex to our simplex. And remember, we can write a vector x as x0, v0, plus xn, vn. We'll let y be f of x. That'll be y0 v0 plus yn vn. Sometimes instead of y0, we might write f sub 0 of x. And over here, we might write f sub n of x. Okay. So we're not writing things in Cartesian coordinates. We're writing things in terms of the vertices of the simplex. What do we know about the x's? So what's going to be true about the x's? I'm sorry? Sums to 1, and what else? No negative. Normally we say they're between 0 and 1, but if you tell me they sum to 1 and they're non-negative, I can't have anything beyond 1. So 0 less equal to xi less equal to 1, the sum of xi equals 1. Think of it as assigning, you're doing a combination of the vertices. You're telling how much in this direction, how much in this direction, how much in this direction. I'll go 20% in this direction, 30% in this direction, 80% in that direction. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Right. So you have 100 units to distribute. You have 1%. What do we know about the y's? So we have a map from the simplex to the simplex. What do we know about the y's? 
Yes? Same thing. Same thing. 0 less than or equal to yi less than or equal to 1, and then the sum of the yi's equals 1. So there's some really clever ideas in terms of how the proof is finished. Normally, how would you prove two vectors are equal? Now, I give you two vectors. How do you tell if they're equal? Create yeah, create the components. So x equals y if and only if xk is greater than or equal to yk. If you were to write this in a linear algebra class, would you expect to lose points? Yes. Typically, this is not going to be enough for the equality. Why in this problem, instead of showing that the components are equal, I just show every component of x is at least as large as every component of y? They both sum to 1. Both sum to 1. If one of the components of x was strictly greater than a component of y, they couldn't sum to the same thing. They couldn't sum to 1. So if xl is greater than yl, then the sum of the yl does not equal the sum of the xl, which is 1. And that's going to be our contradiction. So this is a really nice idea that when you're working with these simplices, that if you want to prove that two things are equal, rather than calculating each component and showing that they're equal, you just have to show that they're close. OK. So here is what we can do. So Spooner to Brower. So I have my triangle. I have some point x. And it's mapped to some point y. What would be the greatest thing possible? Yes. If they're the same. Case one, there exists an x such that f of x equals x. Done. Right? So case two. Assume for all x, f of x does not equal x. OK? So if I'm happy, if I'm lucky enough to have you know, a fixed point, not surprisingly, I have a fixed point. And then Sperner's lemma will clearly imply the existence of a fixed point because I've got one to begin with. The difficulty is, what if I don't have a fixed point, but Sperner is true? So I want to now somehow use Spooner to get a contradiction to say that this can't happen, that Spooner prevents case 2 from ever occurring. Well, if f of x does not equal x, then there is a first index such that unequal. And x is is larger than f of x's. So in other words, you choose the smallest k such that xk is greater than our yk, which is our kth component. And here's the thing, look, if they're not equal, they've got to differ somewhere, right? Could they differ somewhere by having every x coordinate strictly less than every y coordinate? No, why not? They sum to 1. As sum to 1, at least one x component larger and at least one smaller. Right? They both have to sum to 1. If every x was less than the corresponding y, then the sum of the x's would be less than the sum of the y's, which is one contradiction. So there's at least one coordinate where it's larger. Let m of x be this k. 
So I have a new map. It's an integer map. Think of it as a coloring. Think of it as a labeling. You give me a, a vector x, and I assign a number to it. In this case, 0, 1, or 2, depending on which component is the first component of x that is larger than the corresponding component of f of x. OK? Does this now begin to look like Sperner's lemma? You give me any point on the triangle, any point on the tetrahedron, and I can now assign a number to it. What else do we need to make sure that this is the same m that we need for labeling to use Sperner? What else do we need? It's not enough to just assign a label. There's another condition needed in the labeling of the triangle. Check the edges. Check the edges. Must show label edges correctly. All right, let's think about what's going on. Over here, this is the vector x equals 1 times v0. I'm trying to assign a label such that I take the smallest index where x is greater than f of x. Only one entry of x is non-zero, the first entry. Is it possible that it could be x1? No. Could it be x2? No. I have just one v0. Wherever f of x is, could be over here, could be over here. It's not over here. It's moved. Because it's moved, it's no longer 1 times v0. It's got some amount in the others. So we know that f of x has less than 1 v0. So we would have to label this 0. Similarly, we would have to label this 1, and we would have to label this 2. There's no other way we can label, because we're looking for the first index such that they're not equal. Well, this is always 1. So the only way that this is not the first index is if f of x is also equal to 1 here. Well, if f of x equals 1, what is it? It's a, it's a fixed point. All right, so now let's look over here. Let's look at the 0, 1 edge. So now if we're at some point over here, this is going to be x0, v0, plus x1, v1. And now we know it's not a fixed point, so we can go someplace else. Is it possible that I could assign the index 2 to this point? If I assign the index 2, then that means whatever I map it to, it's got to have the same v0 component, it's got to have the same v1 component, and it's got to have a smaller v2 component. That's absurd. This already sums up, you know, x0 plus x1 is already 1 here. If it's winning in the x2 component, it, it has too large of a sum. I can only use the labels 0 and 1 along here. And similarly, you can only use 1 and 2 down here. You can only use 0 and 2 over here. We have a Sperner labeling. We have a valid labeling. So what does Spooner tell us? So what do we get from Spooner now? Spooner implies what? Good. No matter how you subdivide, at least one triangle with all three labels. And if you don't want to do triangles, if you want to do tetrahedrons, draw it like this, doesn't really matter. There's at least one n simplex with all labels. And we can make that simplex arbitrarily small. Just keep subdividing. Spooner's lemma says, no matter how you subdivide, you will always get one cell that has every label. Ah, this is really good. 
So we can get a cell of arbitrarily, si arbitrarily small size where we have all three labels. The problem is maybe the first time it was over here. And then maybe it hops over here, then to here, then to here. Then, and it could be hopping around. So this is where we use some analysis. So we have a sequence of triangles that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? So now we use analysis. So we have a sequence of triangles, each is, say, half the size of the previous. What I can always do is I can always just you know, have all the edges. And then analysis tells us some subsequence converges. So I will give you the opportunity to email me if you want in Friday's lecture for me to talk about why real analysis proves a subsequence converges. I'm happy to do that. If you don't want me to do that, don't email. Okay? Or just come to my office, happy to do it in, in office hours. So there's got to be a subsequence that converges. Let's think about what's going on. That triangle is going to converge to a point, converges to a point x star. And let's think about what's happening. So here's my point x star. And on the boundary of this triangle or tetrahedron or whatever, I have a different label at each point. And this is telling me that this point over here is moved in such a way that the zeroth component is larger than what it's moved to. This is moving in such a way that the first component is larger than what it's moved to. This is moving in such a way that the second component is larger than what it moves to. By continuity, as we get closer and closer to zero, all of these points are converging to x star. And so if you have a sequence f of xn um, is less than xn. I had to run to this. So I'll, I'll, I'll put the n here to mean that this is the nth vector in our sequence. And the k subscript means I'm looking at the kth component. So for each k, this is always going to be strictly greater than this. I now take the limit. If this is less than this and I take the limit, could this side ever get greater? Could they get equal? Yes. You know, zero is less than one over n. If I take the limit as n goes to infinity, what's the limit of one over n? Zero. When I take the limit, I now get a less than or equal to. This is going to converge to x star, the kth component, and this will converge to the kth component. And that's exactly what we needed to prove. So again, when we take the limit, we go from less than to less than or equal to. It's larger for each single one. If you want, look at it at this piece of chalk. Is it above the ground? Is it above the ground? At every moment in time, is it above the ground? In the limit, it's on the ground. In the limit, we have an equality, not a strict less than. And so this is exactly what's happening over here. Each one of these points is winning. In the limit, it's got to win in every single direction, or at worst, be tied. But we showed earlier that if we had this less than or equal to, it actually improves to an equality because the sums have to be 1. So this improves to equal. And this finishes the proof. So this is the proof of Sperner's lemma. Okay? So this is a major result. And we will now be able to use this in Friday's class to do rental harmony applications of this and actually see a constructive version of Sperner's lemma. Okay.